Hello and welcome to this Cronkite News Special Edition. I'm Kevin Gessner. Thanks for joining us. Tonight we bring you a series of reports from our Borderlands beat, from our team coverage on Latino issues stemming from national policy to a range of stories important to Arizona trans border populations and culture. Thousands of migrants crossing from Mexico into Arizona have disappeared in the Sonoran Desert. Cronkite News reporter Chelsea Ray Banez went to the border and tells us just how many people have died. Many of those people, even today, are unidentified, their fate unknown even to their families. One Tucson artist has made it his mission to remember them. Alvaro Inciso builds wooden crosses in his art studio, each one with a red dot meant to represent a place of death. No, not many people know about 3,000 casualties here, 2,000 people missing. He makes the crosses to honor hundreds of people who have died crossing the desert from Mexico into Arizona. The plan was to go there and stand where a person died and see what, what, how it felt, you know, how, you know, try to imagine the story that we will never know. One of his crosses is for a baby who died here on Aravaca Road, about 11 miles from the border. And so I put a cross there. And then people learned that this was a baby that never had a chance. The Pima County Medical Examiner's Office in Tucson reports that more than 2,700 remains have been found in the Sonoran Desert since 2001. About 1,000 of those have never been identified. On paper, the number one cause of death uh, over the last few years has been undetermined, not environmental related. That's because of the condition of the remains. Hess said identifying a body is directly related to how long it's been in the desert. Humanitarian groups like the Tucson Samaritans have tried to prevent these deaths by leaving water jugs along the desert trails used by migrants. We have at least decreased the, the deaths in the areas that we serve, which are basically between this road and that mountain. However, in CISO, just wants the dead remembered. In 20 years from now, we'll begin to write this chapter of American history is going to be very sad, very shameful that we didn't treat our neighbors right. The U.S. Border Patrol has tracked nearly 7,000 deaths in the desert since 1998. Often those bodies remain unidentified because their families who are fearful of deportation don't claim them. I'm Chelsea Ray Banez, Cronkite News. According to the Arizona Coalition to End Sexual and Domestic Violence, one in four women and one in seven men have experienced domestic violence in their lifetime. Cronkite News reporter Courtney Malley takes a closer look at one particular group that feels they're not getting the resources they need. The coalition also says Native American women face domestic violence at rates much higher than the national average. This can be attributed to many factors, but I spoke to three women who say domestic violence in their community is due primarily to a lack of awareness. And then that's when I heard my uncle say, I don't know how you're going to tell Kayla, but your mom didn't make it. 22-year-old Kayla White was just 12 years old when her mom was killed by her father. The way she had things set up for my siblings and I, she knew something was going to happen to her. Growing up, Kayla says she didn't realize she was seeing signs of domestic violence at home, and she's not the only one. Native American women have a 50% higher chance of facing domestic violence abuse than any other woman in the United States. And on average, Native Americans ages 12 and older experience nearly 6,000 sexual assaults per year, 25% of those committed by a close family member. She didn't really want to say anything because she wanted to protect our family and our family name. In many of the reservations, there's no outlets like counseling therapy, none of that. It's basic, basic programs. These women say the high rates of domestic violence on Native American reservations are due to a lack of communication and a lack of resources, just like the women's shelter behind me. There was no homes, there was no anything. One organization, however, is providing help and relief. The Community Alliance Against Family Abuse is working toward creating more accessible and applicable resources for Native American reservations in southern Arizona. One of our big concentrations is specifically on better serving the tribal communities because we recognize, you know, one of the biggest barriers to service right now is just access. Someone experiences sexual assault, say in Casa Grande or Maricopa, 
they actually have to be driven up to Scottsdale or to Mesa. Although Native American communities are still experiencing domestic violence rates higher than average. I would say they do have their own unique barriers that they face. Having the rural isolation, having the historical trauma, um, you know, having potential substance use problems. Because some of them didn't even have a name for sexual assault. Townsend says they have a comprehensive plan for the next three years to hopefully change that. Because back then I was just like, oh, this thing happened. This is going to ruin my family. But the way I see it now is that it's made us stronger in a way. Hispanic Heritage Month, a time to celebrate the cultural contributions Hispanic and Latino, Latino Americans make, is coming to a close this weekend. Cronkite News reporter Courtney Malley made a stop by Tour de Hispanica to discuss what it means to be Hispanic in 2017. The Programming and Activities Board at Arizona State University's downtown campus hosted Tour de Hispanica, an event to highlight Hispanic and Latino heritage in Arizona. With food, dancing, and people of all ages coming together to participate in this Hispanic tour, ASU makes efforts to shine light on all cultures. It's important for the Programming and Activities Board to put on these types of events because we often celebrate a lot of different things, but Hispanic Heritage Month, it's not often celebrated as much as Black History Month or Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Hispanic culture here in the valley. The focus is not only on past accomplishments, but also looks to the future for what it means to be Hispanic in the current political climate. It's important to learn about Hispanic culture and Hispanic Heritage Month because a lot of us recognize that currently we're being used as a scapegoat and like a political tool to elevate one's power. And so for me, being here creates a stance that we're here, we're existing, we're living, we're breathing. We won't let those political comments to tear us and what we're celebrating. I don't necessarily think it's important to celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month just because of the political heat. I think it was already important to celebrate. But I think now it's more important just because we need to hold on to who we are and remember where we're from and not let go of that just because of social changes or political ideologies that are becoming popular. Those who attended the event also say they're proud of their Hispanic and Latino backgrounds and look forward to the future. In Phoenix, Courtney Malley, Cronkite News. And nearly two months after President Trump's decision to end DACA, students at ASU are still showing their support for DREAMers. They did so in a big way by marching through ASU's Tempe campus, calling attention to the issue and reminding people the fight continues. Cronkite News reporter for Tessa Latifi was there as ASU students took to the streets. This is what democracy looks like! All different kinds of voices coming together as one and fighting for the rights of DREAMers. I'm an ally. So I support DECA and I support their rights to be here. I have an undocumented uh, DACA uh, sister who is also a recipient and I am here for her. According to estimates by ASU's administration, there are between 250 and 300 DACA students at ASU. Thursday's march was also used as a battle cry against Arizona Attorney General Mark Brnovich. Brnovich is currently suing the Arizona Board of Regents, alleging too many sharp increases in tuition in Arizona public universities. However, for some who participated in the demonstration, the real reason behind the lawsuit is to deny in-state tuition for DACA students. Please don't take away our education. We want to get educated and give back. We want to uplift communities and people from all backgrounds. At one point, students read from their newly written Sun Devil Unity. Constitution. All students are equal, regardless of skin color, nationality, gender, immigration status, or appearance. With uncertainty looming in the future, DACA student Vasti La Madrid says demonstrations like these give her the strength to face what may come next. And I feel like it's not just us, we have a whole community behind us. Uh, so it's definitely empowering, um, and we definitely feel like we're strong enough to like fight whatever it is that we have to. In Tempe, for Tessa Latifi, Cronkite News. We'll if Congress doesn't act in favor of DACA recipients by March, as many as 30,000 people per month for the next two years could lose their protected status. It's been almost two months since Hurricane Maria made landfall in Puerto Rico. Since then, thousands have been without power, water, and shelter. Puerto Rican residents are now relocating to the mainland, facing a very uncertain future. 
Cronkite News reporter Courtney Malley sat down with Hurricane Maria survivors who now find themselves calling the valley home. The Cruz Torres family came to Fountain Hills just over a week ago after their home was destroyed by crashing power lines. Now they're staying here with their daughter. The last couple of months have been traumatic for the family, and one of the first things they had to face with communications down was not knowing if their loved ones were even alive. Oh my God, dear God, I told my husband, what are we going to do now? While those in Puerto Rico wondered where food and clean water would come from each day, families here on the mainland had their worries too. Yeah, it was hard. It was hard. I think, I think everybody who is here, who has family in Puerto Rico, kind of felt the same way. We all felt like, you know, the uncertainty and the frustration and uh, the inability to get through the telephone. 81-year-old Maria Torres has survived multiple hurricanes in her lifetime, but this one, she says, this one was the worst of all. Dear God, this was such a sad thing, so sad. I've lived through Hurricane John, Hugo, Federico, Santa Clara, but this one took us. Everything was shaking, the houses were shaking. I told my husband, we're going to have to go. We're going to have to go with Maria. But they didn't go. They survived, and now they're here in Arizona, living a life they never thought they would, but they're not alone. It's estimated 60 to 75,000 Puerto Ricans came to the mainland in the three weeks right after the devastating storm hit in late September. So unfortunately, what we will see is more families leaving the, the island, a decrease in the population, which, which will result on, uh, you know, worse economic outlook. These families are leaving because 57 percent of the island still doesn't have electricity and 12 percent don't have running water. I had a big drum on the balcony and we drank water from there. I cooked from there. That's that's what we used to bathe and to fill our toilets. At one point, I felt the water was making me sick. People will have to leave, right? So if there's no money to repair the schools, if there's not enough money to repair the electrical grid, the infrastructure, that's just compounding what was happening. The Cruz Torres family remains hopeful they'll get through this, saying they want to go back home one day. But for now, Arizona is home. If there's something we are, is that we're resilient and we're very creative. And it's been wonderful to see how the community has, in spite of all of this, um, it has come together. But Puerto Rico is still struggling. As of this morning, only 18% of the island has power due to a major outage. The U.S. government says more than 140,000 Puerto Ricans have fled so far, relocating in, this, in the continental United States. That number is expected to rise. Courtney Malley. Cronkite News. Meanwhile, Phoenix's Puerto Rican community is finding innovative ways to help with the relief effort, including an open mic night at the Herberger Theater Center. Cronkite News reporter Fortessa Latifi was there as they took to the stage. Poetry, music, miming, a raffle, and drinks are all part of the way Phoenix is showing their support for Puerto Rico. This open mic night, which collected funds for relief aid, is personal for Jessica Gonzalez, founder of Arriba PR and one of the organizers of the event. I myself have family that um, withstood damage and um, are currently going through um, lack of access of clean water, um, support and rebuilding of their homes, and also just access to uh, goods that can help them um, just stay alive, like food and water. Ken Ween hosts the monthly open mic nights and says he didn't think twice when approached to do a fundraiser for those affected by the storm on the island. There's one thing here we're all here for, hopefully, which is to get some money together to help get stuff to the people in need in Puerto Rico. The Herberger Theater Center hosts monthly open mics, but this is the first time they've dedicated an open mic to a cause. One way to help out was by buying raffle tickets. The prizes included a Fender guitar and scuba lessons. Marsha Macy came out and shared her hopes for Puerto Rico. And they are going to lift themselves right up. I just know it. Good to have a little help from your friends, right? Okay. For Gonzalez, nights like these are about building bridges between the Phoenix community and Puerto Rico, and she has some advice on how to do just that. Elevate our culture, celebrate our people, and recognize that we are here to rebuild. We are not lazy. We're work, we work really hard, and we love everything about the United States. We're proud citizens, and we're here with you, and we want to embrace you in, in, in our family. In Phoenix, for Tessa Latifi, Cronkite News. Arriba PR set up a center on 16th Street where they are accepting donations. 
Dolores Huerta, a union leader, mother, political and civil rights activist, is one of the lesser known figures in recent history. But her impact is felt today by thousands. And now her story is being told on the big screen. Cronkite News had a chance to sit down with Huerta to discuss her life's work. The documentary Dolores explores the life of Dolores Huerta, who started her career as a grammar teacher in a farming community in California, but then resigned when she realized the poor living conditions of her students' families. She then went on to fight alongside Cesar Chavez for migrant farmer rights. And coming to a house where there was uh, no linoleum or wood on the floor, just a dirt floor, and the family had uh, orange crates for furniture and cardboard boxes for furniture. And uh, the children looked malnourished, and I decided that that was wrong. Dolores Huerta co-founded what would become the United Farm Workers and was Cesar Chavez's counterpart for decades. In 1965, UFW organized protests and a boycott against the Coachella Valley grape growers to advocate for better working conditions for those in the fields. After five years of fighting, 26 grape growers signed an agreement reducing the use of pesticides and providing unemployment and health care benefits for its workers. She also aided in passing the first law to recognize the rights of farm workers to bargain collectively in 1975. During the prime of her activism career, the phrase, Si se puede, or in English, Yes we can, was coined right here in Arizona. When Cesar Chavez was doing a 25-day water-only fast, and some of our professional Latinos that I went to visit said to me, oh, you know, you can't do what you do in California here in Arizona. Arizona is a very different state, so in Arizona, no se puede, you can't do that. And my response to them was, yes, you can, si se puede in Arizona. And so that, that's how the phrase was born. Now in 2017, the impacts of Huerta's work live on. <laughs> Rafael Reyes, who attended the documentary screening, grew up in a farming community, and his parents were directly affected by Huerta's changes. For all of their efforts on behalf of my parents and my wife's parents, who were farmers, they had no drinking water, no shade, no health care benefits. So we lived through all that experience, and thanks to her and Cesar Chavez and the union, we can have a better life. Dolores Huerta has been honored with many awards for her work, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2012 from President Obama. For the full multimedia report on Huerta, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org. In the Broadcast Center, Courtney Malley, Cronkite News. Los Veteranos de Arizona served as a platform for local Latino veterans to come together and showcase their stories of war through art. Cronkite News reporter Alex Valdez was there and shares why the creators say art can keep Hispanic history and culture alive. When I was in the military, there was a lot of Latinos in there, and they did a good job. Through his art, Vietnam veteran Jim Carubius wants to share the important role Latino service members have had through the years in the military. Proud to be veterans and be part of the history. But we want respect. Respect and honor were some of the main themes visible throughout Los Veteranos de Arizona, an art exhibit that opened over the weekend, coinciding with Veterans Day. Local Latino veterans came together to give the South Phoenix community a piece of the battlefield that the three artists say often is forgotten. Jose Giron says he wants younger generations to know certain parts of history that sometimes aren't found in the history books. Every war that America's been in, uh, Latinos' has, presence has been there. And uh, I want the, the community to know that and be proud of, of their heritage and be proud of their service. Making action possible for Southern Arizona says there are currently 500,000 veterans in Arizona. Hispanics make up 10.6% of that population compared to the national average of 5.6%. What did they do when they got out? Did they turn anti-American? No, they built American legions, neighborhoods, became teachers, became leaders. One thing these veterans all agree on, the color of your skin or where you come from doesn't matter on the battlefield. But during combat, it didn't matter if you were black, white, or purple, you know, we were all brothers. In Phoenix, Alex Valdez, Cronkite News. Now, if you'd like to see the show, Los Veteranos de Arizona exhibit is currently on display at the Sagrado Galleria until November 29th. At a time when some parts of the Latino community feel attacked and lacking in resources, One Valley Clinic has dedicated itself to giving hope to those immigrants who do not have access to health care coverage. Cronkite News reporter Alex Valdez shows us how this center is offering care and support to its patients. Alex?
It can be daunting to try to get health care when someone doesn't speak the language or doesn't have the legal status to navigate an already complicated system. The mission of Phoenix Allies for Community Health Clinic is to cut through all that red tape and simply provide much needed and often not found medical care. Everywhere you go, you feel that position that pretty much everybody is against everybody. You come over here and you don't feel that. When Luis Edgar Chavez realized he needed medical care, he didn't know where to turn to. But a chance encounter brought him here to the Phoenix Allies for Community Health Clinic, which treats patients like Chavez, who was undocumented. One day I was uh, feeling really sick in the day, so they gave me some kind of like emergencies help with uh, an IV. Seems simple enough, but for certain parts of the immigrant community, finances, paperwork, or proper documentation can be roadblocks to getting the health care they need. But at Poch, that's not the case. The clinic located in West Phoenix has its doors open to whomever may need it, regardless of their status. The clinic is primarily run by volunteers and medical students with certified doctors doing occasional rounds. It's funded 100% through donations. Poch currently provides health care free of cost to the immigrant community. Immigrants often have trouble obtaining insurance or other health care assistance provided by the government. So a lot of immigrants are here on visas and they have a green card. McMullen says POTCH treats many chronic diseases among the immigrant community. Like hypertension, uh, diabetes, high cholesterol. For patients like Chavez, a place like POTCH not only provides him with medical care, it also gives peace of mind. Like way easier to come over here and get health treatment than trying to go to a regular hospital, other clinics. Poch is one of three Valley clinics that currently treats both documented and undocumented immigrants free of charge, with the number of patients they are able to see related to the amount of monetary donations they do receive. In the Broadcast Center, Alex Valdez, Cronkite News. A Valley woman is Forbes is one of Forbes's 30 under 30 this year. Reina Montoya is a DACA recipient and founder of Aliento, a community organization focused on helping undocumented youth and mixed status families in Arizona. Crockett News reporter Courtney Malley spoke with Montoya about what this award means for the DACA movement. Reina Montoya founded Aliento in 2016 after her personal experience with an issue many families face in Arizona, being separated from a parent due to immigration status. Her family fled to our state from Tijuana, Mexico when she was just 13 years old. But after she graduated college, her father was detained for nine months, turning her community activism into a career. I knew theoretically like how to get my dad out, outside of detention, how to fight his deportation, but what I didn't know it was how to process what it meant to me emotionally. It was because of her own stress and anxiety after being separated from her father that Rena Montoya founded Aliento. The organization focuses on community healing through art and political education, and now her work is being nationally recognized as one of Forbes magazine's 30 under 30 for social entrepreneurship in 2017. But Montoya says winning this title this is not only about Reina Montoya, this is about, look America, what is the nation that, that we can be, right? What are the possibilities? With a staff of six people, the organization provides financial and emotional support for Dreamers after the Trump administration rescinded DACA in early September. So we put up together fundraisers, we were able to help over 60 DACA recipients to get a scholarship so then they wouldn't have to pay for the $500 fee. We partnered up with attorneys to ensure that um, Dreamers would have pro bono help. So then we could prevent as many barriers for them to actually get the renewal process. While Montoya works to try and ensure other Dreamers have a better future, her own is uncertain after she failed to qualify for renewal of her protected status. Aliento is organizing a caravan traveling from Arizona to Washington, D.C. on November 25th, advocating for a more permanent solution for Dreamers. So now I really hope that through our efforts and the efforts of many other people across the nation, that they're able to see the urgency and then we actually have a vote before Christmas. So that would be the best Christmas present. The Mexican holiday Dia de los Muertos isn't until November 1st, but that's not stopping some from starting early. For the Phoenix Fridas, a Latina women's art collective, they're ready for the holiday. As for Tessa Latifi reports, the group hosted a themed craft night at a local bookstore. 
Dia de los Muertos translates to Day of the Dead, but Phoenix Frida's founder, Kathy Cano Mario, says the holiday is about more than mourning. And it's a way of embracing and accepting death as part of the journey and not fearing it, and knowing that it's all part of the celebration of life. Participants decorated candles, sewed felt skulls, and made many shrines for loved ones they wanted to honor. Some took part in the Day of the Dead tradition of face painting. Kendall Gum had her face painted to honor her father, grandfather, and uncle. I wanted to represent everybody I know who's moved on and is moving on with their journey. The Phoenix Fridas are named after the famous Mexican artist Frida Kahlo. Monique Sanderson Mata relates to Frida Kahlo's use of art as a coping mechanism. But I know what it's like to have that struggle, to have to depend on people and to feel helpless and art is the only thing that got me through that. Attendees worked side by side, drinking wine and crafting traditional Day of the Dead art. I'm crafting and drinking. <laughs> so we just got done making um, candles or decorating candles, so I'm on to the next table. We're having a blast. <laughs> Sugar skulls are a staple of Day of the Dead celebrations. Cano Mario explains the symbolism behind them. Where the sugar represents the sweetness of life, the skull represents that their body's not here, they're, they're gone. Some attendees took time to add something personal to the shrine the Frida set up. Cano Mario says the Day of the Dead is about finding meaning in loss. This is about me feeling blessed that I had this person in my life. I had these life lessons to learn from them, and I want to celebrate that on this day. And the, the idea that their spirit returns for that one time, oh, that's so beautiful. In Phoenix, for Tessa Latifi, Cronkite News. Thanks for joining us for this special edition of Cronkite News. For more multimedia coverage, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org and click on the Borderlands tab.